letters began to circulate among the uh, revolutionary soldiers indicating that there was a considerable amount of frustration in the revolutionary army towards the young American Congress. They had made promises and pledges of supporting the troops and providing for their financial needs. And yet after a considerable period of time, there seemed to be uh, nothing done for the soldiers. Some of the captains received these letters and determined that they would have uh, an irregular meeting, a private meeting among themselves to decide what they should do. And a couple of courses of action were proposed to them. One would be to uh, teach the people a lesson that they needed the army by having the army go out into the field and sit there while the British armies came into the towns and communities and wreaked havoc among the population. Kind of like going on strike. Uh, the other uh, solution was uh, to actually go in and forcibly take from the population uh, what they needed in terms of support. If you're not going to give it to us, we'll take it from you. So these kinds of discussions were ongoing and word got to General George Washington that these letters were circulating among his troops. So he first ordered that they should not meet in an irregular fashion, but rather meet at the regular meeting that was coming up. They, they agreed to do that. There was some suggestion that possibly Washington was on the side of the troops in this regard. And so finally when they met on the regular time, they were not expecting it, but General George Washington came to the meeting, and with all the captains of his army sitting there before him, he stood up and made a speech, one of the great speeches of the Revolution, in which he expressed his great confidence and his affection for the army, but warned them against these kinds of actions which were divisive and destructive to the people and to all that they were working towards. He urged them to trust in the young Congress and to allow them time to find the resources that they needed to support the army. He was sure that they would have their, their support. Not everyone was happy with the general's remarks. Uh, after he made his remarks, he had a letter which he wanted to read to them from one of the congressmen, citing the financial position of the Congress. And as he had this letter before them, he tried to squint and read and see what was said. And he couldn't read. So he pulled out his spectacles, which they didn't know that he had to wear. And he put them on and he said, in my service for my country, I've not only gone gray, but I've also lost my eyesight. And in that moment of humility and humanity, Washington turned the hearts of his soldiers. And they put their trust in him. And they waited. The impact of the commander in the army can be profound as he leads the people through distress and trouble and, and uh, perilous times, when they have a good commander, they can do that which is right and accomplish great things. And at that moment, because of what General Washington did, our democracy was saved from a military power, civil government was secured, and we enjoy the freedoms that we have today. Years ago, Joshua was faced with a tremendous challenge. He and the people of Israel crossed the Canaan, the land, excuse me, crossed the Jericho River, excuse me, the Jordan River. I'm getting old. <laughs> they crossed the Jordan River, and before them was the city of Jericho. And they were commanded to go now and conquer the land before them. Joshua was a new leader. Moses was laid aside to rest on the other side of the Jordan. Joshua was now to lead the people into battle. And the night before going to war against the city of Jericho, Joshua, uh, perhaps 
went off on his own out in, into the, the plains and began to look over the city, perhaps try to look for defensive weaknesses and consider what ways in which they could attack the city and bring it down. In the course of this, where he's faced with this insurmountable city in front of him, walled off and sealed off, secure, he happens to come across a man walking perhaps in the gloom of the night. And he's uncertain as to who he is. And so with his military bearing, with his command and control personality, he comes up to this individual and says, whose side are you on? Our side or on theirs? Now the individual has a rather ominous appearance. He has his sword drawn, ready for battle. And the answer of this one is, No, but I am come as the commander of the Lord's army. And right away, Joshua was confronted with the angel of the Lord who had appeared time and time again in the history of Israel. At key moments, at moments of battle, this angel of the Lord made his appearance before the people of God, assuring them of God's presence in history and time, working on the behalf of his people. Uh, you can find various stories and accounts of this angel of the Lord, this angel who uh, went with Israel as they uh, left Egypt, and when Pharaoh and his armies came after them, the angel of the Lord watched over them uh, above the pillar of cloud uh, that they had there. This angel of the covenant would appear, first of all, to Moses at Mount Sinai earlier when he called the Lord, excuse me, called Moses to follow him and go back to Egypt. This angel of the Lord was a, a, a vision of the Lord himself. You note that the in this text, in the fifth chapter, he says, I am the commander of the armies of the Lord. So he makes a distinction between him and the Lord. He is not the Lord, he is distinct. But at the same time, he says, take off the sandals from your feet because the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. And he receives the worship of Joshua. Now you know in the, the scriptures, created angels refuse to receive the worship of those to whom, before whom they appear. Remember in the book of Revelation, John sees the angel and wishes to give him worship. The angel says, no, don't worship me, worship God. Here this individual appearing before Joshua receives Joshua's worship tells him that he's standing on the holy ground, which is evidence of the fact that God himself is present. This is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of the covenant, coming as the Son of God, appearing in human form, pre-incarnate human form, to reveal his presence among his people. The Lord is present in the camp. What a tremendous vision Joshua had of just what he needed to know. When he goes to face the citadel of evil there right at the brink of the land of Canaan, this city of Jericho, and face what would appear in human terms an insurmountable task, he is reminded that God himself is present among his people. And the battle would be the Lord's battle. What a tremendous encouragement to Joshua to know that he was not on his own. But the battle is the Lord's. And the Lord himself would come to fight for his people. Maybe at this point Joshua remind, was reminded of the song of, of Moses that Miriam sang just on the other side of the the waters of the Red Sea that had collapsed over the armies of Pharaoh and the, uh, Miriam and others break out their tambourines and dance and sing the song of Moses in Exodus 15, praising the Lord who is a warrior. 
and who overthrew the armies of Pharaoh, cast their armies into the sea. The Lord is a warrior. And Joshua is reminded of this. The Lord who appears before him comes in battle form, ready to fight for the kingdom of God, for righteousness, for the advance of God's purposes in the world. The Lord is not merely a dove who comes and offers peace. He is also a warrior who brings wrath upon the enemy. And this is how he appears before Joshua. We need to be strengthened as well today by this same vision of our Lord who is a warrior, who engages in the battles of the Lord and does not leave us alone to conquer the forces of wickedness and evil in the world today. When we look around us, we see impregnable fortresses. We see dominant forces of humanism and so forth in various institutions of our nation and around the world. How do we overcome? We see darkness at work in families and friends, and we wonder how can God's work advance? Perhaps you've had an occasion where you've sat with a neighbor, friend, or a loved one and talked to them about the gospel of Christ, and you see in their mind, in their eyes, like a wall go up, an impregnable wall. There's no interest. They're apathetic. There's a, 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 a subtle hostility to that which is being said. You're a sinner. You need to repent. You need to give your life over to Jesus Christ and follow after Him. A wall goes up. And they don't wish to listen to that. How is that wall going to be brought down? <clears throat> we need to be reminded that the commander of the Lord's army is with His people. And He will accomplish His purposes in the world. The battle is the Lord's. This reminds us that if the battle is the Lord's, then we must depend upon Him and worship Him. That we might know His presence among us and go forward with confidence and boldness in the calling that He has for us. There's a remarkable account here of the instructions that the Lord gives to Joshua. This is not going to be your ordinary battle plan with various tactics as to how to attack this city. There will be no ramps going up the walls, no uh, scaling of the walls, no lobbing of uh, mortars over the walls or anything like that. This would not be your ordinary warfare. This would be a miraculous warfare, a holy war, set apart in a miraculous way at the very start of this campaign, so that Israel would know that the battle is indeed the Lord's. And though from this place they will go from city to city and conduct an ordinary war with swords and shields and so forth, this beginning of the war would impress upon Israel that at every point in the way, even in the ordinary forms of battle, the battle is always the Lord's. It's always His warfare. And one of the central things in the conduct of warfare is worship. Worshiping this glorious Lord. The instructions given to Joshua echo this idea of worship. The kingdom would advance through the advance of God's covenant word. The Lord gives instructions to Joshua to have the people march around the city of Jericho seven times, once each day for seven days. And on the final day, they would march around that city seven times. You have the idea of the sabbatical pattern being established. There would be seven priests with seven trumpets who would blow these horns as they marched around the city. They would have the Ark of the Covenant in their midst at the very heart of the armies as they marched around the city. The city was not a very large city, but the lines of the army would be extended all around the city as they marched around. And it would be an unusual thing for the people to do this. Walk around the city, 
in silence, listening to these trumpets blow as we go all around? Why does God give us this instruction? Why this sabbatical pattern? Why the Ark of the Covenant in our midst? God has lessons for His people, for their spiritual warfare in all of this. He intends to show us something of the way in which He works in our midst. And first, the emphasis is on faith. Trust in the Lord. He gives these unusual instructions to His people and commands them to obey. How often is it when God gives you some directions in your life and you wonder, well, what's the sense in that? What's the sense in coming to church Sunday after Sunday and hearing some guy speak in front of you for 30 minutes, singing these old hymns with, with a, a wonderful keyboard that's played wonderfully, but <laughs> it's old hymns. <clears throat> Why do we go through this week after week after week? It's Christ's instruction. It's His purpose. And slowly, silently, repeatedly, over and over again, His Word begins to take root. His Word begins to grow. Understanding develops. Suddenly you're seeing broader things, deeper things. You're having a greater view of the world around you and who you are in God's kingdom. Slowly but surely, as you, as you are quiet and you wait and you listen, you obey, God does His work in your life, in your church, in your family, in your community. Day by day, slowly but surely, you do what God tells you to do. It's like going out on your job. You do your, your job. I used to work in sales. You do certain things over and over and over again. And hopefully the sale will come. And then you go on to the next sale and the next one. You just do it until you're building an income. You're building a home. You're building a family. You're building things. But it goes day by day. Sometimes slowly, sometimes in a very boring way. But that's what God calls us to do. The elementary things of life, you just do them in obedience before the Lord. And then suddenly amazing things happen. The sabbatical pattern enforces upon God's people the sense that they have to rest in the Lord. To trust in Him. That's especially the case on this seventh day, when they walk around the city seven times. How do you think the army was doing after that seventh march around the city? I would think they'd be fairly tired. <laughs> and now they're going to conduct war? You wore them out! The battle is the Lord's. And we rest in Him. Not in our flesh. Not in who we are. Not in our strength or wisdom, what have you. It is the Lord's. It is a spiritual battle. And so when we look at the great evils in the world today, and we wish to overcome, we see the way in which wickedness has uh, worked its way into our society. We wish to target this and that form of evil and try to overcome it. How do you overcome it? There are all kinds of ways. Writing to your congressman, calling him up, protesting, writing letters to the editor, getting all kinds of uh, uh, relief efforts, social efforts, feeding, and so forth. All kinds of ways in which you can do it. But you need to rest in the Lord. And recognize that the battle is the Lord's. It is a spiritual war that we are engaged in. And not merely a second war. So the sabbatical pattern encourages the people to rest in the Lord and in His provision. The sounding of the trumpets affirms the same. The battle is the Lord's. The Ark of the Covenant, the Word of God, is at the heart and center of that whole ministry. We live by the Word of God. We rest in God's revelation of Himself. And as we follow that Ark, we will have victory in life. We will overcome the world. Trust in the Lord. You'll be amazed at what happens. 
The walls came down. Jericho collapsed. The people came in. They conquered. They destroyed. They revealed the wrath of God against the, the wicked. And God went on through His people from there to conquer all the land of Canaan for His church. Great things happen when you trust in the Lord. Commit your ways to Him. When you have citadels of evil in your home, your personal life, in your community at large, how are you going to overcome them? Don't do it in your own strength. But commit it to the Lord. Trust in His Word. Obey Him. Even in the meaningless things. And you will see Him do great things. Persevere in that which God gives you to do. You never know what God may do. I posted on my Facebook page a video of a uh, professor from Tulane University. Some of you may have already seen it in which he recounts how he was an evolutionary scientist, professor in his university, and he taught from the viewpoint of evolution. And argued it for year after year after year. And one day he had this uh, young woman in his class, a student, who came up to him after a, a, a lecture, and she wanted to ask him some questions about what he had to say. She said, that was a great lecture, I got some questions though, and he saw that she had some legal paper with all kinds of questions, so okay, we'll sit down after class and talk. She comes by and she starts asking him a variety of questions. You'll have to watch the tape for that. But as he's trying to answer these questions, he begin, begins to have a dawning realization that his position makes no sense. It just doesn't make sense. Mathematically, the he does, starts doing some calculations as to how probable it is that certain things might happen. And it's entirely improbable. And he just goes through one area after another, and, and he just begins to affirm his own faith in evolution. We're here, and so therefore evolution must have happened. And as he's saying these things, he's realizing how hollow his arguments are. And then he goes on to recount how he, he changed his mind about evolution, he began to adopt creation science. He, he says, he puts it this way, I said, oh my God. And he didn't mean that in a profane manner. But it suddenly dawned on him that God created everything. And that's the only reasonable explanation for the world around us today. The light dawned, the walls fell down. He says he became a creation scientist, and then after that became a Christian. And received Christ as his Savior. The walls came down. Because a college student asked him some probing questions. And God, by his Spirit, took those questions and began to open his mind and allow him to see the foolishness of his position. You never know when the walls will come down. Ask those questions. Continue faithful in your witness. You never know. The walls came down. The Apostle Paul, I think, in 1 Thessalonians, in his letter to the church there, picks up the information here and reminds us that there is coming a day when the walls will once more come down with the blast of the trumpet and the shout of the archangel. There is a day coming when Christ the Lord, Jesus himself, will come and bring this current world order to an end. He will conquer this Jericho and establish the new heavens and the new earth. Then we will see the kingdom of God in all of its fullness, its beauty and glory. And then we will see the commander of the Lord's army, a mighty host, including the angels of all of creation. The commander of the army of the Lord he is present in his church. He's present with you in your daily battles. Trust in him. Rest in him. Commit your battles to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word.
this morning. We pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts, that we would see the advance of your kingdom in our personal lives, that we would overcome the uh, sins that uh, uh, seem so difficult to, to rid ourselves of. We pray for the help of your spirit. We pray that you would advance your kingdom in our homes and our families and throughout our church and world. We ask it in Jesus' name.